to welcome everybody to this week's uh, happy hour session. Um, hopefully you got the mail out. We'll be covering uh, a few deep fungal infections this week. And uh, uh, I'll, I thought I had my chat open. Let me go ahead and open my, uh, my chat here. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to manage the chat while I'm, um, let me move it while I am uh, giving my talk. Oops, it's like I'm moving that, not the chat. Um, hmm, there we go. Um, but if, if I don't get your question, please feel free to email us at education at sagesdx.com or uh, you can uh, email me directly at tdavis at sagesdx.com or always uh, text or call. My cell phone is 210-416-4815. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, before we discuss the slides, there were just a, a few general principles that I wanted to uh, to point out regarding uh, fungal infections and um, infections in general. Now, as most of you have heard me say, when we look at slides under the microscope as dermatopathologists, we tend to look at them without benefit of history. It's about the only way that we can look at a slide in a truly unbiased fashion and not be led by the witness, uh, so to speak. That being said, Good testmanship would tell you that when you're taking a board exam, you want to look at the answers first. I mean, that, again, that's just good testmanship. Um, and so immediately you're going to know when you're on a bug hunt. I mean, if everything in the, the answer choices is an infectious organism, you know, things are pretty obvious there. So with that in mind, I think, first of all, it's, it's very key to familiarize yourself with uh, the morphologic features and general size of the more common deep fungal uh, infections or the organisms causing deep fungal uh, or a variety of infections. Same thing could be said with, uh, with parasites, uh, helminths, et cetera. And in most textbooks of uh, dermatopathology, be they Whedon or Elston or Rapini's text, uh, there are a lot of good plates or photomicrographs. And so I think before you take your board, spend some time uh, studying the, the morphology of the organisms. You also want to have an idea of the general size of the organisms. And you'll see as we uh, uh, go through and look at some of the sections, you've got an internal ruler in almost every biopsy specimen because a, a lymphocyte and an RBC are both in the five to seven micron range. So you've got an internal ruler uh, that you can use to assess size of organisms. Uh, second, I would uh, kind of be cognizant of the most common histologic patterns uh, if there are any associated with a given infectious agent. And that has to do with host response. And what do we mean by that? Well, there are certain deep fungal infections uh, or uh, demediaceous uh, fungal infections, chromoblastomycosis, uh, coxy, North American blasto, that tend to be regularly associated with pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. Um, uh, some of the other organisms uh, or infections uh, are characterized by parasitized histiocytes. Uh, histoplasmosis leash. So uh, again, we not only wanna be aware of the morphologic features, of the particular uh, infectious organisms, their size, but also the type of host response they tend to induce. Now, some don't fit nicely into a given category and that's fine. Um, and then third, you want to uh, be familiar with the high yield areas and tissue to look for organisms. Uh, a lot of times when uh, a slide of an infectious uh, process is presented, it's a big piece of tissue. And so with a limited amount of time, you want to direct your search for organisms. And the high yield areas to look uh, for fungal organisms are in uh, neutrophilic microabscesses, uh, zones of necrosis, and the cytoplasm of multinucleated giant cells. Try to avoid spending a lot of time uh, looking in real well-defined or uh, well-formed granulomas because usually that is implying that the host is mounting a, a pretty good immune response. So with that being said, we will uh, go ahead and get started. 
Uh, our first slide, slide uh, number one, uh, was a bisected punch biopsy. And uh, readily apparent is fairly extensive dermal fibrosis. So if you look at the um, left piece of tissue and in the, the right half of this, you can see there's a little bit of dermal fibrosis with absence at, absence of adnexal structures. Uh, and this was a case that I saw. And I have to admit, I, I noticed on scan the zone of fibrosis and also uh, a vertically oriented perifollicular infiltrate, which was centered around uh, a disrupted hair follicle here. And you can see there's disrupted follicular uh, epithelium here. And it, again, granulomatous inflammation. And my first thought was, well, this, this is likely um, a fibrosis scar and granulomatous inflammation due to rupture focus of folliculitis or rupture cyst, common things uh, being common. Uh, but, uh, you know, I noticed that there was quite a bit of uh, degeneration of collagen here, some multinucleated cells. And so, you know, thinking, well, maybe it's Miyake's or something like that. I went down under high, uh, to uh, higher power. And what became readily apparent and hopefully most of you saw uh, this, was the presence of these large spherules uh, present within the giant cells, these multinucleated giant cells. Uh, there's one here and um, another one right here. And uh, what's distinctive about these spherules, in addition to their large size, which we'll comment on in a minute, is that they have this uh, kind of this uh, thick, refractile wall. And uh, many of them had kind of this bubbly uh, blue purple cytoplasm. We can see that even over here. Better look at the uh, refractile wall of this spherule and kind of this bubbly uh, blue gray uh, cytoplasm. You know, it's been described as lacy like as well. In some of the other structures, you can almost see endospores forming. And what about the size of these spherules? Well, again, we've got an RBC right here. Let me go ahead and get my pencil. Uh, and again, realizing that this RBC is about five micron, microns. These, these spherules are big. These are in the range of you know, 30, 40, 50 microns. And the size and morphologic appearance of here, uh, these uh, spherules, of course, is very characteristic of coccidiomycosis, which at times will produce pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, but at times will just produce suppurative and granulomatous inflammation uh, in the dermis. And really, this is about the only organism this big that you're going to see uh, in the skin. Uh, the only other thing which might cause some confusion, and I've got a slide of it here, is a rhinosporidiosis. And personally, I've never seen uh, cutaneous rhinosporidiosis. Uh, this is uh, a, a condition which uh, was caused by an organism that traditionally has been regarded as a fungus, but is now considered a protistin parasite. And the lesions tend to show predilection for mucosal surfaces, especially the nasal and pharyngeal mucosa. And the, the, the sporangia that you see in rhinosporidiosis dwarf those seen in uh, coxie. In coxie, the, the uh, sporangia, the spherules tend to be 10 to 80 microns in size. In uh, rhinosporidiosis, they're 100 to 400 microns in size, and they contain thousands of uh, endospores, so they're much, much bigger. And in the non-sporulating trophocytes uh, in rhinosporidiosis, unlike uh, coxie, you uh, frequently can see a centrally located uh, nucleus. So uh, again, I, not likely to be tested on rhinosporidiosis on boards. If you see a really large organism, uh, then nine times out of 10, you know, it's gonna be coxie. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next case. Let me give it a second to load. And uh, in this particular biopsy specimen, the action was actually going on in the subcutaneous tissue. Here, the uh, epidermis and dermis are largely unremarkable. And we've got this large nodule down in the dermis. And this is, this is actually a lymph node with effacement uh, of, the, of the architecture. And we can see we've got this central area of uh, necrosis. 
And then uh, replacing the nodal architecture here, and it'll become obvious since we move to higher power, we've got a large focus of granulomatous inflammation. Uh, as we move to higher power, we begin to see a lot of these clear spaces. And I'll have to admit, you know, when I first looked at these sections, I thought, oh, you know, these look a little like parasitized histiocytes. And so, you know, started thinking about things like uh, leishmaniasis or histoplasmosis. But as we move to higher power, we can see that these clear spaces, some of them are, are actually within the cytoplasm of histiocytes, but the, the uh, organisms, rather than being one to two microns in diameter, are a little bit larger. Most of them are in the five to 10 micron range. Again, you've got to find a lymphocyte uh, to see these. And they're pleomorphic yeast forms. So they're not real uniform. They, they vary somewhat in size and shape. And these clear spaces are actually large accumulations of uh, the gelatinous capsule. Uh, of this organism. This is histoplasmosis. And what we have here are these gelatinous condominiums. And again, the, the characteristic thing about crypto is it's, it's a pleomorphic yeast form. So there's variability in the size and the shape of the organisms. And they tend to be very gregarious. Uh, they, don't, they don't socially isolate very well. They like to uh, kind of live uh, in, in clusters or condos. And, you know, if you examine these at higher power, uh, you can see some of these have kind of these narrow uh, based buds. Um, the capsule of the organisms, of course, will stain with Musi Carmen. So if we applied a Musi Carmen stain to these sections, these clear stasis spaces would be red. The organisms will stain with PAS and GMS, and actually Montana Masson stain will stain these uh, black, which is kind of unusual because they're not really pigmented. Now, crypto can uh, induce both a granulomatous response and a gelatinous response. And the amount of granulomatous inflammation is kind of inversely proportional to how much of the capsule is present. Generally, as a rule of thumb, if the patient is somewhat immunosuppressed, you're going to have many more organisms and a lot less granulomatous inflammation and more capsule, more clear spaces. As the host immune response uh, kind of gets stronger or more robust, one tends to see <clears throat> fewer organisms and uh, less of a gelatinous capsule and more of a granulomatous response. So sometimes uh, the diagnosis can be a little bit challenging. And uh, in that case, sometimes, you know, one has to use ancillary testing, uh, either PCR, there are some IHC stains that will target or end stain the organisms or even uh, uh, electron microscopy. Uh, but this is, this is pretty classic uh, crypto. Again, I think the only thing in this particular uh, slide that you might confuse it with is uh, par parasitized histiocyte of uh, leash or histo. But again, these organisms are more pleomorphic and much larger in size than what we would see in uh, the setting of um, histoplasmosis or leishmaniasis. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next case. Okay, our next case, I'm gonna flip the slide a little bit. This is uh, a very fragmented uh, biopsy specimen. The tissue was somewhat, somewhat necrotic. And uh, let's go ahead and zoom in on this piece of tissue. We can see an ulceration and a lot of purulent scale crust. Uh, but if we look adjacent to the ulceration, we can see we've got a fair amount of pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia here in part derived from follicular epithelium. There are a whole lot of neutrophils. So we kind of have pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. Some of the neutrophilic collections are actually within the uh, epidermis. And then I think readily uh, apparent in these sections. Uh, actually, this is the most organisms I've ever seen in this condition. We've got these thick walled yeast forms. And again, if our RBC here uh, over here is about five millimeters. Here, I'm gonna circle one of the RBCs. Then we can see that these organisms uh, are in the range uh, really of 
uh, 10 to 15 microns. Some of them are actually even a little bit bigger. And these are thick walled yeast worms with somewhat of an asymmetric wall. Uh, I couldn't see any real good buds here, but typically if you see a bud, you see broad base buds. And this is an example of blastomycosis. Uh, this patient was immunosuppressed, accounting for the huge number of organisms here. Generally a blasto in an immunocompetent individual, one will see not near as many organisms, maybe one one hundredth. Uh, but it is a condition characterized by pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus and frequently one will see the organism either in multinucleated histiocytes or within neutrophilic microabscesses uh, within the um, epidermis. Uh, these organisms will stain with GMS uh, and PAS. And of course, this is a condition which uh, uh, tends to be endemic uh, around the Great Lakes and in the Ohio and uh, Mississippi River Valleys. Uh, we don't see much of it, uh, at least in Texas. We tend to see a lot more, uh, say, leishmaniasis and uh, coxy than we do uh, blasto. So uh, you know, if you, if you live in an area where it's endemic, you're probably going to see a lot more. But this is this is a very characteristic appearance uh, of the uh, of the organism causing North American blastomycosis. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide seven. It's kind of a cool case, and uh, let me flip the slide. And in this particular biopsy specimen. Uh, we have an incisional biopsy. This was from the trunk. And one can see extending from the dermis, actually down into the subcutaneous tissue and embedded within a pretty fibrotic dermis. We've got these large uh, nodular accumulations of cells. And if we move to higher power, uh, we begin to see that we've actually got granulomatous inflammation here. So we've got collections of epithelioid histiocytes, uh, many of them multinucleated, embedded within this uh, fibrotic stroma. And moving to higher power, one can see uh, that what we have here are several fungal cells. And again, if we look at our lymphocyte, and that's about five to seven micron, we can see that most of these fungal cells are about six to 12 microns. And if you looked around, you could see, and of course now I won't be able to find it, but you could see some of them were uh, adjacent to one another or stuck together in a manner that resembled pop beads. So here we've got one, two organisms uh, adjacent to one another. Uh, that are forming kind of pop bead like structures. And it's, it's the appearance of the, the, uh, these fungal elements and the pop bead appearance and the uh, dermal fibrosis that is uh, very characteristic of uh, lobomycosis, which is what this is. Lobomycosis is also known as uh, keloidal blastomycosis. The organisms will stain with uh, PAS and GMS and this, this refractile wall. And again, this, this pop bead like arrangement of the uh, organisms is very characteristic. This is a condition which is seen almost exclusively in um, uh, Central and South America and is, is believed to be due to traumatic implantation uh, of the organism. So just a real pretty example here of lobomycosis. Okay, hey, moving on to slide eight. Slide eight was a little bit more of a challenge and it's one of the points that I wanted to make here. We've got a shade biopsy and uh, probably from the trunk or proximal extremity. There's a little bit of purulent scale crust within the stratum corneum. There's uh, kind of a dense nodular infiltrate within the dermis and there's pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia here and a lot of pus. And uh, surrounding this abscess, there are some histiocytes and there were even a few multinucleated histiocytes. So we've got separative and granulomatous uh, dermatitis associated with uh, epidermal hyperplasia. You know, this is, this is almost like an intraepidermal neutrophilic microabscess. And so we're already thinking, you know, um, with separative and granulomatous inflammation, this is likely infectious. 
but you know, you, you look at the sections, you know, you carefully scrutinize the abscess, you can look at some of the giant cells, there are no organisms here. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a, a feeling that we're on a bug hunt. And so in this particular instance, we ordered PAS, GMS, uh, AFB, bite, and tissue gram stains. And again, no organisms. And yet the patient had clinically sporotrichoid nodules uh, on the arm. And so uh, when we saw this case, I called the clinician that said, you know, if you're really thinking something infectious, you should probably go ahead and do a biopsy uh, of tissue for the express purpose of microbiologic cultures, which he did. And the cultures, sure enough, grew up. Uh, sporotrichosis. So sporotrichosis is, is a little bit unique. The organisms, as a rule, in an immunocompetent individual are few and far between. And even with special stains, they can be very hard to recognize in tissue. Uh, it's not surprising at all with either this or nocardia uh, for the diagnosis to be made, uh, not uh, on the basis of H&E or special stains, but on the basis of uh, microbiologic cultures. I do have a GMS of a, a case of Sporo that I'll share with you, not this particular case, but this was another case uh, that I had. The patient was uh, immunosuppressed, had a rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, uh, grew out Sporo on culture. If you do have to see Sporo uh, on uh, special stains, this is a GMS stain, stains the fungus back. It's caused by a pleomorphic yeast, and at least... Uh, some of the yeast forms will have, uh, and I'm going to circle one here, kind of this cigar-shaped morphology. So this is sporotrichosis, and uh, again, pleomorphic yeast and cigar forms. But this is, it's few and far between the, the instances in which you can see the organism uh, in, in sections, okay? Well, let's go ahead and look at a couple of uh, cases, our next two, in which we get parasitized histiocytes. And from a pragmatic viewpoint, you know, I would definitely know for board uh, purposes all of the potential causes of parasitized histiocytes. But I can tell you, the only two that you're going to routinely see in H and D stained sections are histoplasmosis and leishmaniasis. And the problem is, of course, that they're both about the same size. So how do we distinguish them? This is something that I think most of you probably already know already. Uh, we have a shade biopsy here. We have rather pronounced epidermal hyperplasia. We have a nodular infiltrate within the dermis. Uh, looks mixed. We can see some uh, small dark cells here, probably lymphocytes, maybe a few plasma cells. And then, you know, it's pretty clear that we have some histiocytes here uh, as well, some cells with more abundant cytoplasm. And as we move to higher power, we can see that many of these histocy histiocytes contain this numerous organisms within their cytoplasm. And these organisms, again, if we have our RBC here, and that's about five microns, are one to two micron in size, microns in size, and they're much more uniform than the um, case of crypto that we looked at. These are, these are not particularly pleomorphic and they're not preferentially located at the periphery of the cell, rather they're stuffing the cytoplasm of the histiocytes. Uh, PAS and GMS would light this up. And this is an example of histoplasmosis. Uh, Leishmaniasis, as we'll see in a minute, looks very similar, parasitized histiocytes about the same size. However, in leishmaniasis, the organisms, of course, tend to cluster at the periphery of the cell. And so we get more clear staining spaces typically in tissue and usually a higher instance of plasma cells uh, within the infiltrate as well. So this is a very characteristic appearance of histo, one to two micron organisms within the cytoplasm of histiocytes filling the cell. Uh, slide 11, we'll go ahead and take a, a closer look at, or one slide 11, it's my slide 11 with the PowerPoint. Uh, I think this was actually slide seven. So we have this uh, shade biopsy and we can see a little bit of crusting and again, a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia. There's a nodular infiltrate of histiocytes uh, within the dermis. 
fair number of lymphocytes here. And uh, we see these clear staining histiocytes again, but if you look at the distribution of these one to two micron organisms here, you can see a striking uh, tendency to line up around the periphery of the cell, producing the marquee or Ferris wheel sign. And when you see that change, especially if you've got a heavy infiltrate of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells, you know, you're almost certainly dealing with uh, leishmaniasis. And uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the CDC offers uh, free PCR uh, uh, for speciation and identification of the organisms, as well as free culture. And uh, all you have to do is, is go onto their website and uh, download the instructions for submitting a uh, specimen. And with leash, you want to make sure you, you get a good species identification because uh, treatment and uh, morbidity can vary uh, depending upon what, what particular uh, form of, of leishmaniasis, of what particular organism is, is causing the uh, particular disease, whether it's Leishmania tropica, Leishmania mexicana, et cetera. Uh, so this is very characteristic uh, for leishmaniasis. Uh, of note, there have been some studies the past few years in the literature that have looked at the utility of, of CD1A uh, staining to identify the, the little imastigotes here, um, especially with uh, some of the old world leishmaniasis, but in my experience with, with even some of the new world leishmaniasis, um, CD1A staining uh, will highlight these organisms as well, uh, so for, for what it's worth. Okay, well, next we'll look at a couple uh, of mycetomas. And mycetomas, of course, are, are conditions in which one sees grains within the tissue. And we're going to look first at a eumycetoma caused by a true fungus. And then the second was an example of an actinomycetoma. Now, uh, the two can show very, very similar histology. Uh, a lot of times the result from implantation of the organism into the tissue. They can be deep dermal, or in this case, subcutaneous. Uh, the, the host will usually form uh, a zone of fibrosis trying to contain the uh, infection. And usually what one sees are grains embedded within a neutrophilic microabscess. So we can see a big abscess here, uh, another one over here. And in the central portion, of this abscess, we have these grains. Of course, in the setting of a eumycetoma, the causative organism is a true fungus. And I think, you know, obviously we had a fine focus. We could see that there were refractile hyphal elements here. But I think even uh, uh, with a uh, scan section, you can see there are uh, a tangle of hyphal elements comprising this grain. Some of these are actually even pigmented. This was a dark grain eumycetoma uh, caused by a demediaceous fungus. Um, if they show you a mycetoma on a board exam, they're almost uh, certainly going to give you a special stain. So, you know, you would either have a PAS or a GMS of this grain and you would see the hyphal elements or in the setting of an actinomycetoma, which we'll look at next, you would have a tissue gram stain and you would able, be able to see the, the uh, filamentous bacteria. But I think even uh, here, one can see uh, kind of branching hyphal elements here. It kind of looks a little like the, the uh, appearance of an organism on a KOH stain and these are pigmented. Okay, our next case uh, let's go ahead and flip the slide here. We can again see a lot of uh, suppuration in an edematous dermis nodular infiltrate. There are clearly some lymphocytes and histiocytes, but we've got these large uh, neutrophilic microabscesses in the dermis. And clearly here we have grains. And both of the grains, I meant to point it out on the last one, we do have some of the splendori hoplite phenomenon with these radiating eosinophilic clubs out at the periphery that represent precipitated immunoglobulin. Uh, and their presence can be seen in both eumycetoma and actinomycetoma. If we were to do a PAS or GMS stain here, this would be negative, but a tissue gram stain would show a tangle of filamentous bacteria. And it's the filamentous 
and branching bacteria, uh, which they probably show you on a board exam, which makes this an uh, actinomycetoma. Now, a third condition, which you know, is a bacterial infection, which can produce grains, is botryomycosis. And we've looked at that in prior sessions. Uh, the grains can look very similar. With botryo, a tissue gram is either going to show you gram positive, most common gram positive cocci. Occasionally, uh, you can get a uh, case of botryo due to gram negative organisms. But what, what you won't see are filamentous branching organisms. Uh, and that's what distinguishes botryomycosis uh, from an actinomycetoma. So again, actinomycetoma, uh, filamentous bacteria on gram stain branching uh, with a eumycetoma, you're going to see hypholum. It's frequently pigmented. And uh, of the three, uh, botryo, actino, and eumycetoma, in my experience, the fungal organisms are, are the ones that are easiest to see in the and identify with certainty in the H and D state sections, although we will always confirm with uh, PAS or GMS. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next case. Uh, now, our next case was a, a mess of a piece of tissue. This just completely fell apart, very necrotic tissue, and uh, a lot of edema, uh, and this is just kind of necrotic dermis. And uh, as we move into higher power, we can see, you know, there, there's extensive necrosis, maybe a few neutrophils here, you know, definitely a lot of, of histiocytes and neutrophils. And then when we look in the cytoplasm of the histiocytes, as, as you start kind of looking around, what you begin to see uh, are these kind of clear staining uh, organisms. And uh, what these are, uh, are um, uh, sporangia. And some of the sporangia have internal septation. And so they, they're producing these morula or mulberry-like cells. Um, these, uh, some of the cells look a little like soccer balls with glues, grooves in them. That is some of these sporangia. They're within the cytoplasm of histiocytes. And uh, this appearance, is very characteristic of prototheogenesis, and uh, this is a uh, condition that's caused by an achloric algae. Uh, frequently, will uh, uh, can be a cause of electron burst bursitis, uh, and um, again, these sporangia are uh, present within uh, cytoplasm, and uh, they will stain with PAS and GMS. So PAS or GMS will will highlight the, uh, the organism here. Okay, and then we're, we're gonna go, go ahead and close out with a couple of infections caused by demediaceous fungi, okay, or, or pigmented uh, fungal elements. Uh, the first biopsy specimen, let me tilt the slide here, is from an acral surface. One can see compact orthokeratosis, a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia. And then uh, within the dermis, we've got a nodular infiltrate extending down into the subcutaneous tissue. One can see it's surrounded by fibrosis. So you know, the host is probably making an attempt to wall this off. And we've got kind of this stellate collection of cells within the dermis. Uh, and no big surprise, if we move to higher power, we can see a lot of neutrophils and neutrophilic nuclear dust. And So we've got separative and granulomatous inflammation, pretty good indication that uh, we're going to be on a bug hunt. Um, if we look uh, within the central portion of the abscess, let me move here, then hopefully you guys were able to identify readily pigmented septal as pigmented uh, septate hyphal elements, which were branching. And uh, th this constellation of features is, is diagnostic of a fatal hyphal mycotic cyst. Um, so fatal hyphal mycotic cyst or fatal hyphal mycosis uh, are caused by demediaceous fungi. Again, 
uh, they're uh, the result typically of traumatic implantation. Um, the the uh, nodules are usually located deep in the dermis. They're suppurative and uh, granulomatous inflammation. And this is in uh, uh, contradistinction to the uh, last slide that we'll look at. Um, this is another uh, infection caused by demediaceous fungi. Here we can see a much more superficial biopsy. We have pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia here. And within the dermis, uh, we've got accumulations of histiocytes and again, neutrophils. And, and indeed, in the central portion of uh, some of these granulomas, there are small microabscesses. But if you hunted around here uh, in within some of these foci, uh, there were uh, characteristic uh, spores, medlar bodies or copper pennies or sclerotic bodies. Of course, now I won't be able to find any. Uh, but um, uh, th this is a very characteristic appearance for chromomycosis. Both organisms are caused by a demediaceous fungus. In the setting of chromomycosis, uh, rather than seeing pigmented hyphalomates, one will see uh, spores, uh, and it produces pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus, and uh, the uh, uh, thiohyphomycosis will tend to produce, um, here's one right here, uh, medlar body, will tend to produce um, deeper inflammation, separative and granulomatous inflammation, and the morphology of the organisms uh, differs. Um, th the spores in chromo can show internal septation, uh, so be aware of that, and, uh, but, but you won't see branching hypolomates like you will in thiohyphomycosis. So that kind of rounds out our uh, Beef, brief foray into deep fungal infections. Uh, hope that was helpful. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to email me or uh, call me. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Next week, uh, Dr. Vickers is going to be uh, discussing some melanocytic tumors. So thank you very much and have a nice evening.